It should record. Didn't I record this before? Yeah. And it didn't show up on the list. None of you found it. No one's used it. It wasn't there. It didn't work. Okay. Well, let's hope it works today. All right. We can. I don't want to do that. Yes. Okay. So um, the other important piece of information, if you did not get the email from me, um, was that I posted um, the uh, study guide for your exam this morning. So it's up. Your exam is one week from today and uh, in this classroom, and you will need a pencil and a Scantron. You want the skinny green guy, which is Form 882E. Um, has 50 questions on one side. I think there's going to be 75 questions on your test. There might be 50. There might be 66. I don't know how many I write. It depends. But you'll be able to do it in the hour and a half that you have. In fact, most people finish this test more quickly than the time they have, and you're free to go once it's finished. That'll be next week. So um, this is the one. Um, so now we have a couple things to do before we get to that. Uh, last we were here, we were talking about Mendelian genetics, and you guys did my little extra credit with the Labrador Retrievers. Um, I believe about five people got it correct. The scores haven't been put onto the system yet, but they will be by my assistant this week. So you'll get your credit for that. Um, yeah, the study guide that I put up is a list of terms from lecture and the textbook that I would like you to know for the exam. So it's divided up into section by topic, right? That we, all the topics that we've covered, and then there'll just be a list of terms. So go through the list, and if there's something that you're not familiar with, find it in your class notes, or if you can use Tegrity for the one that's recorded, which will be today, um, and uh, or you can use the book as well. Okay? There's a little section at the very end, which is some stuff that specifically comes from the textbook, and I put it separate so you'd know to look for, for it in the textbook because you might not recognize it or don't remember that we talked about it in class because we may not have. Okay? On Friday, when I have my office hour, we're going to have a review session. I have not gotten a room yet. I will. It will be somewhere on this floor, and it will go from 1 to about 2.30, and you're invited to show up. I believe I'll be able to record it on Tegrity, so if you don't show up, you can listen to it, and that will help you as well. I recommend doing that if you can't make it on Friday. Okay? Are there any other questions before we get started? No? So hopefully you, um, I did show you the results of the Punnett square that I had wanted you to do for this one. And that's, okay, so now it's recording. Uh, this was the Punnett square that for the Labradors, okay? Um, with the yellow lab shown in yellow, the brown shown in brown, and the black lab shown in black, okay? Um, I did show you this briefly last class, right? At the very end. Okay. Um, perhaps the problem is difficult for you. There will be nothing that is that difficult on the test. The only Punnett square problems are not independent assortment or regulatory genes of the kind where this Punnett square has four cells and it's just one trait. And I give you the information you need to figure out, like the percentage of offspring. Okay. Um, so in case you didn't get it, here's now explain that again. We're different how. We don't get it. All right. Uh, and then this one I like too, yellow lab, black lab, chocolate lab, meth lab. <laughs> so, I don't know, just some memes to brighten your day. Now let's get back to your regular programming here. Molecular, we don't need yet. I've got a couple more slides in, in the Mendel material, and then we'll get into molecular, which we'll spend the next two days doing, although most of next class will actually be a film. Uh, here we go. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the, what we were doing with the lab, the lab example in the Punnett Square was actually to look at another deviation from Mendelian genetics. Okay. So I gave you this problem as an example of something that deviates from simple Mendelian traits, how things are more complicated than that in reality. 
Okay, another way that things are more complicated in reality than they are in Mendel's experiments are uh, sex-linked traits. Sex-linked traits are found on the X chromosome, but not the Y, okay? The difference between males and females is, is that females have what? Two X's, and males have X and Y, okay? Now, the X and Y chromosome are very different little chromosomes. The X chromosome has approximately 1,100 genes on it. The Y chromosome has less than 50. The Y chromosome that in actually is what makes you male, okay? Um, some of those genes are what makes you male, uh, is a very, very small chromosome with very little genetic material on it. And what that means is that all of those genes that are only found on the X chromosome, males only have a single copy of, whereas females have two. And that means that if any of them are recessive, they're expressed in the male phenotype, even though they'd be masked in the female in the presence of a dominant allele. Okay? And that, for example, is why it is commonly the pattern that females are carriers for colorblindness, whereas males have it because it is located on this chromosome. Okay? I should tell you that lots of other primates also have vision-related uh, genes on their, on, their, on their X chromosome that produce sex-linked traits differences in terms of how, what colors they see. And we'll get back to this. Color vision is a characteristic of primates in general, but it doesn't quite play out the same way all over the primate order. When we talk about primates, we'll talk about this after your exam. So there are a number of things that, that are found uh, on genes on the, on the X chromosome, so the males only have a single copy of them, and that explains the patterns of inheritance of some things like baldness or color blindness, as well as hemophilia, which is a blood clotting problem. You lack the protein that causes blood to clot. Um, and that, too, is a situation where females typically are carriers and males actually have it expressed in their phenotype, okay? So recessive traits, therefore, are present in the male phenotype. Um, this is a red-green color blindness test, okay? And before I administer it to you, I would like to say a few things. The first thing I'd like to say is that I am not a doctor. Well, I am a doctor, but I'm a doctor of anthropology. So please do not take this as an actual medical diagnosis. I showed this to a kid in one semester and explained that what you see in the field in, of, in, this, in this image will, can diagnose you as to whether or not you're colorblind. And the kid just freaked out completely. He was like, oh, my God, I'm blind. He just was, like, <laughs> running around the class screaming. And it was like, after that, I thought, well, maybe I should warn people. Okay. So the question is, what number do you see here? Five. You're not supposed to tell other people your answers. Most of you say five? Yes. Most of you say five. All right. Ten percent of males in the American population are red-green colorblind. It's about 14 million in the U.S., Individuals with red-green color blindness will see a two because they can't discern the blue and the green that make up the five, okay? So if you saw a two, it may mean that you're colorblind, but they'll never give you that diagnosis until you're given a whole bunch of tests like this, which you can take online. You can look this up online and take a bunch of others. And if you consistently give the colorblind answer, it may mean that you're colorblind. There's other forms of colorblindness, by the way. This is just one. Sir. The S is five. Oh, so if you see an S, you're fine. Yeah, the S is five. They're like that. They're a little imprecise, and plus I've actually I've magnified it larger than it's intended to be, so it sort of distorts the effect slightly. If you see an eight, I would still get online and 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 <laughs> and, and look at the look at the other other examples of colorblind tests that are available online. Okay, but. It's really supposed to be a two. If you see the two, that that's, makes it likely, okay? It, actually, if you're not colorblind and you start thinking about it, you can see all of the numbers, but it's really supposed to be what your first impression was, okay? 
So those are what are called sex-linked traits, and they don't follow a Mendelian pattern either because they will frequently, at least as they appear to us in the phenotype, skip a generation, right? People always say baldness skips a generation. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the mother's a carrier and she doesn't have baldness, right? But her, her sons do have baldness. So it appears to skip a generation, but that's because it's a sex-linked trait, okay? Yeah, males are at a big disadvantage, actually. And you know what turns out to be really interesting and relates to the film on sex that we saw is that of the 1,100 genes that are on the X chromosome, many of them are actually related to the brain. So what that would mean is, is that if males have a harmful recessive, they will display it in the phenotype. And if females are selecting males, at least partly on the basis of their intelligence, that will make it quite obvious whether they have that problem because it will be displayed in the phenotype because it's on the X chromosome, right? It explains, for example, the pattern, well, at least some people feel it explains the pattern, in IQ tests. So if you study IQ distribution within populations, the average IQ for males and females in any given population is the same, okay? But the distribution is different. So the male IQ distribution looks like this, whereas the female looks like this, with this middle being 100, right, which is the average IQ. So for females, the average is 100, but that's also the peak within the distribution. For males, you've got males that are smarter and males that have problems, so our distribution tends to be more like a valley with 100 coming in the middle, right? And that's actually the, the result of the fact that these brain genes are located on the X chromosome, which makes males a little more transparent because they can't hide those harmful recessives as easily. It's not everything to do with your brain. It's not your brain's entire makeup, but there are some things that that relate to various various disabilities and problems with learning and other other aspects. Some mental health, some some are related to mental health as well. So there's a lot of brain genes on X, and it's kind of like the peacock's tail in a way, as it gets displayed. Interesting. Okay, uh, this is a family tree of the royal families of Europe who are all intermarried to each other, at least some of them are, um, which shows individuals that either had or were carriers for hemophilia. So hemophilia is a blood clotting problem that if you suffer an injury, you can bleed to death internally because your blood won't clot, okay? Uh, in the 1950s, they invented synthetic proteins, which enabled people to actually produce clotting. But historically, a hemophiliac would almost certainly not get to the age of reproduction. Um, because if you're in the slightest accident, you can bleed to death, right? So the famous case of this was actually the son of the Tsar of, of Russia, right, before the Russian Revolution. The, Tsar, the Tsar's family was executed, so it was kind of irrelevant. But his youngest son, who's called Alexei, who's shown here, all the people who have hemophilia, the squares are males who have hemophilia, the females who are carriers are half circles, and the people who don't have it, quote unquote, are normal, are shown in yellow, okay? So this is the Russian royal family here. The youngest son was a hemophiliac, right, which he, he inherits from his mother, who inherits it from her mother, who inherits it from Queen Victoria, who apparently is the origin of the mutation within all of these families. She didn't inherit it. It was a mutation that occurred when she was born, okay? So then she passes it on, and of course, nobody knew she had a problem because she was a female who was just a carrier, and you didn't, she didn't have any visible effects of this in the phenotype. But because it's X chromosome, her sons have a good chance of catching it. Okay, um, depending on which copy of her X chromosome she passed on, right? Because remember, she's got two copies. So if she passes on a good copy, they don't get it. If she passes on the bad copy, they've got it. They've only got one copy, so that means they have it in the phenotype. They have hemophilia, okay? So, you know, the famous case of this is Alexei, who is the son of, of Tsar Nicholas. And, like, when he was a child, 
he was forbidden from playing, like they wouldn't allow him to play at all, and he had to be carried by an attendant wherever he went because they were so afraid that, like, if he was playing, he would fall and then bleed to death and die. And, um, I mean, of course, eventually it was all irrelevant because he was lined up by a firing squad and shot. And uh, if you're shot by a firing squad, it really doesn't matter if you have hemophilia or not. You're going to bleed to death. Uh, so, but he only lasted until, God, I want to say he was like 9 or 10 when they were all assassinated um, because of the fact that this attendant had to sort of like follow him everywhere. He had this sort of terrible childhood. Later, of course, the protein factor was isolated and synthesized, and so now you can live with this disease. But historically, you couldn't. It would, it would certainly end your life. And that's a good example of a, of a, of a sex-linked trait. Okay, so the la last but not least are environmental influences on the phenotype. And we would call these non-genetic factors. Here's me after three minutes in the sun. Okay, so we've made this point before about tans and sunburns. They are a way the environment affects your phenotype. Okay, so again, you have a genetic basis to produce melanin. If you don't produce much melanin, your body will react to exposure to the sun by getting sunburned like this. Here's another example that somebody may be familiar with if you work at a florist or nursery. Do you know what kind of flower this is? It's a hydrangea, thank you. Um, do you know why I'm putting this on this slide as an example of a non-genetic factor that affects the phenotype? What does it do, what does it do? If your soil is more acidic, you're so awesome. Thank you so much. Do you? I love them too. They're very beautiful. They're, they don't do well as cut flowers, though, because in the heat they die and wilt, but they look great on the, on the plants. Yes, fantastic. Thank you. you do, how many other people in this room knew this was a hydrangea, honestly? To one person? Okay, it's fine. Usually there's one or two people, and usually nobody knows about the, about the soil. But basically, if your soil is more acidic, your hydrangeas will turn blue. And if it's more alkaline, they turn pink. And basically, you can tell the acidity of the soil by looking at the color of the flower. And in fact, you can change the color of your flower each year by doing things like sticking pennies in the ground around the base of the flower. So if you want to change your flower from blue to pink one year, you can do it by just planting some pennies in the ground. This is an example of that, OK? Uh, thank you very much. You're my favorite student of the day. You're student of the day. Um, <laughs> Here's another example. Didn't know what a hydrangea was? Here's another chance for you. Know what that is? What is it? A flamingo. Nice. Hopefully most of you knew that. Why is that an example of a non-genetic factor affecting the phenotype? Yes. It does depend on what they eat. What else do you know about that? Yes, because shrimp contain carotenoids, which give pink or red color to most things in nature. We had this with this uh, sort of um, this problem with people's fish tanks. Remember, I was telling you about the fish that would turn the color of its surroundings. Well, another problem for tropical marine fish tank owners is that if you have something that's red, and it could be crustaceans, you know, like lobsters are red, or fish, they they get their bright red color through the consumption of carotenoids. Well. Most, most sort of manufactured fish foods, even the really good ones that you feed to your fish tank, don't have enough carotenoids in them, which means that most things that you buy that are red in color will fade after you get them. And that was a consistent problem for us. But if, they're, if their diet's high in carotenoids, in particular brine shrimp is what many of them eat, then they will get redder and redder and redder. If they don't have high carotenoids amounts in their diet, then they will be white. And that's why you get, you know, Flamingos on a spectrum from white to right to red. Okay. Last but not least, you know what that is? It's a Siamese cat. I would have actually given you full credit for just cat. <laughs> <laughs> if only the final, if only, if only the exam was this easy. Uh, so why is that an example of non-genetic factors influencing the phenotype? He looks sad. Okay, nice. Anybody know? Well, 
basically what's going to be creating the dark color of the cat? What do we say creates, creates dark color in animals, skin and stuff like that? Melanin. Okay, so melanin creates darker color in the cat. Notice that it does not have an equal distribution, right? That's because the melanin is denatured by the production of another amino acid. And that happens, uh, that, that's a heat temperature, it's, I'm sorry, it's a temperature sensitive process. So basically, where the cat is the warmest, the melanin is denatured and the, and the lighter color is there. But where the cat is darker, which is on its extremities, that's where the, it isn't denatured. Tyrosinase is what it's called, the amino acid that, that denatures the melanin. And the cat's dark. So you can go home and do an experiment. Here's another, here's another problem-based learning opportunity for extra credit. Take your Siamese cat and throw it in the freezer for two weeks. <laughs> No, actually what you can do, which is slightly more humane to your cat, is to make little booties, little sock booties, and put little sock booties on your cat, and their feet will get lighter in color. Actually, if you have a Siamese cat, does anybody, does anybody have a Siamese cat? They, they change color during the course of the year. They get darker in the winter for the same reason. It's precisely the same process. Okay? Fascinating, isn't it? The world around you. So you learn all kinds of things. Flamingos, sunburns, Siamese cats, hydrangeas. Awesome. All right. Now we're going to move on. Meth lab. Let's <laughs> do ah, molecular. Okay. Oh, actually, let's do the film. Do I have my? No. Hold on. Let me get my speakers. I'm going to start by showing you a three and a half minute film that will introduce the topic of genetics to you really fast, and then we'll go from there. Sorry.